All right. Uh, I'm happy to be joined by Greg Hanberg, Senior Vice President of Properties at Artspace, which does real estate development to create and restore places that artists can affordably live and work. Often this will include redevelopment of uh, historic properties. Uh, we most recently wrote about Artspace with the plans for redeveloping the Northrop King Warehouse Campus, uh, which will add 84 affordable residential units to the site. Hey, Greg, uh, thanks for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's good to be here. Yeah, thanks, awesome. Thank you. Um, first, can you just tell me a little bit about your work, uh, what you do, and then tell me about your organization also? Sure. Um, well, I'll start with the organization. Um, I work with Artspace Projects. We're Minneapolis-based, but nationally active. Um, our mission is um, really simple, to create, foster, and preserve um, permanently sustainable places for artists and arts organizations. And so we are um, real estate developers with a focus on arts communities and and uh, arts organizations. And we've been doing this for quite a while. Uh, we were established by the city of Minneapolis's Arts Commission in 1979 as an advocacy organization. And, and in the mid eighties pivoted towards real estate development and opened our first building in Lower Town in 1989, um, the Northern Warehouse Lofts. Um, since then we've been off and running. Um, we own and operate 54 buildings around the country. Um, that are home to uh, 2,000 artist families and over 700 arts-related uh, businesses. Um, I've been doing this um, <clears throat> in the organization for about 23 years. Um, I joined Artspace in 1999, and um, it's really just become my, my life's work. Um, we um, were in 23 states, a number of different communities. What's a little bit different about us um, compared to other real estate development organizations is that um, is that we are um, we're invited into different communities to help them put together um, you know physical building projects that respond to any number of different objectives it could be affordable housing it could be historic preservation it could be cultural facility development it almost it always is cultural facility development it might be transit oriented development it might be sustainable development might be economic development and kind of the crossroads of those objectives are where we live as an organization. And so we, we work in as diverse a places as um, you know, East Harlem, New York City or Honolulu, Hawaii or Seattle or Hamilton, Ohio, which is outside of Cincinnati or Council Bluffs, Iowa, which is outside of Omaha, we, Duluth, Fergus Falls, Minnesota, Brainerd, Minnesota, um, quite a bit of work in, in the Twin Cities area in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and, and fairly recently a building had opened up, a new construction building had opened up in Hastings. Um, we use a, a wide variety of financing resources that are both private and public. And I mean, again, our, as a nonprofit organization, our commitment is just to keep these places as affordable homes for artists for as long, um, for as, long as they want them. Yeah, that's really cool. I didn't realize you were established by uh, Minneapolis Arts Commission. Um, do you have any connection still with nope. that? No, no we, we, we branched off pretty quickly into um, a separate, more traditional 501c3 nonprofit organization. And so, you know, we, we certainly connect with them, you know, occasionally just given our work in, in the Twin Cities, but or in the city of Minneapolis. But, you know, we, we are, um, we're working with different arts commissions all around the country and different arts stakeholders um, to, to do the work that we do. Yeah, cool. Um, so let's start by uh, talking about Northrop King. Um, yeah. It's an old building, right? Built in what, early 1900s? Um, you know, all the way up to, from the early 1900s through, um, I think it, the, the last building was completed in 1949. Uh, sure, because it's, so it's it's built in stages, you know, different buildings at different times. Right. Um, and it's, yeah, so it's an old building. You're bringing affordable units. How do you make something like that work? Um, I guess you don't have to tie it to Northrop King necessarily, but this is what you guys do, right? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, again, this is all about affordable housing, right? And so, um, I mean, the basic way that you make affordable housing work is that rather than have a first mortgage on a property that might be 75% of the project cost, you have a first mortgage on a property that's 20 to 25% of, of project cost. And that just means you have, you have a smaller loan to pay on, which means you can charge less rent. And you know, the trick to that then is finding the additional resources to fill the gap, you know? Um, it's, and that's, that's where you get really, really creative. Um, you know, this is a historic property. And so we have the benefit of both federal and state of Minnesota historic tax credits. Um, 
We are providing affordable housing, which will provide access to, to the federal low-income housing tax credit program. There are um, different funding uh, resources that are available through the Met Council, through the city of Minneapolis, through Hennepin County. Um, and those relate to either affordable housing or livable communities or environmental cleanup. Um, and we assemble those, those different pools of funds kind of into a capital stack that's fairly complex um, and that allows you to, um, to charge rents that folks can afford. Yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you navigate some of that finding funding for affordable units, especially in maybe a market that you're not as familiar with? <clears throat> You know, it's, that's kind of the trick. I mean, the, you know, the first trick is, is finding them. And, and oddly enough, you know, there are certain usual suspects that are out there. They might be called different things, but they're housed in similar agencies um, in different communities. And, you know, there are different resources, sometimes controlled by bigger cities than, than there are by smaller cities. But, but so we know where to look. Um, the more challenging um, the more challenging process is convincing folks that access to these, that our, that our projects, which are, are the best use for these highly competitive resources. And you have to understand that, that these resources don't have anything for the most part to do with the arts. And so convincing folks that, that, that the work that you're doing is touching all kinds of different public objectives and, and create a situation where the project really does merit the award of this type of financing is is a lot of the work that we do. A lot of it's um, storytelling and trying to figure out what re real objectives are and 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 creating a project that responds to those objectives. Yeah. So, I guess let's touch on that a little bit. Um, like artists specifically, I wh wh why why artists? What um, do you see a lot of reception from, from <clears throat> communities? Like, yeah, we love the arts. Um, yeah, tell me about that. Well, well I think people generally. Um, value the arts as a quality of life kind of thing. So I think that the arts are, are a valued public sector objective. Mm -hmm. um, from why affordable housing for artists, I think has a lot to do um, with the fact that artists benefit from space that is both specifically designed to meet kind of their living and working needs, but then also owned and operated in a way that supports kind of their their creative lives, and and that's what we do. And there just aren't them aren't that many people do. Well, there's nobody doing that kind of nationally in a systematic way. There are some terrific projects that are happening in different communities around the country as a result of local initiatives. But doing this kind of as as the core mission of what we do and doing it kind of systematically around the country is um, th there aren't a lot of folks doing that. Yeah, sure. Um, and you talked about you know doing storytelling and having to kind of pitch what is this going to benefit. How would you say some of your projects have benefited the communities that they're in? Well, you know, you can, well, when you think about the Northrop King um, campus, um, and we have, we have two other buildings in Northeast. We have, uh, we operate the Grain Belt Studios building, which are two of the two-story buildings on the Grain Belt campus, and, and another affordable housing development, Jack Flats um, at 18th and a half in Jackson Street. But, you know, in 2019, um, you know, that entire campus was, I think, very much in danger of falling out of arts use. It, um, you know, there, there was going to be a transition in ownership given um, transition at Shamrock companies. And to, to Stanton family's credit, you know, they really wanted to find a way to make, um, to, to continue, you know, the operation of those working studios and make them available for artists. And we were able to work with them with that as our primary objective. But the opportunity at North of King then to add 84 units of 24 seven kind of live work housing. And then in some of the other vacant building areas, additional working space and, and fabrication space, creative space for, for the arts, I think is, is really gonna pivot from a spot where perhaps the arts you know, at North of King were threatened um, to a situation where there's a doubling down um, on the arts. And I think that that, you know, I look at the Northeast Arts District, which is, I believe, you know, the largest arts district in the country, and and Art of World is probably the largest neighborhood-based art event um, in the country, and you know, maintaining that that cultural uh, center for the city of Minneapolis, I think, is really important. Um, in other cities, it might be something much much smaller. You know, it might be, um, uh, it, it might be in, in Seattle. Seattle is um, was facing 
uh, in the early 2000s, an earthquake, and then the dot-com boom, and their historic neighborhoods, Pioneer Square, which was the home for artists, was facing massive displacement of artists, um, just given the gentrification that was happening kind of in Pioneer Square. And we were able to create a project that, that really established a, a beachhead to make sure that the arts continued to have a permanent home there. And, and those kind of things are valued in community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I, yeah, I've been through uh, Northrop King, you know, long before I, I knew about uh, your work. And even before the residential units, it's just a cool place to go. All the yeah. studios and things to see. Um, yeah, like cool. People like their art crawls, people like their their coffee shops, you like the yeah. wine bars. Yeah. Right. Um, so talking about uh, historical properties, um, what kind of challenges come with redeveloping a historic property while also preserving it? And yeah, what a, can you walk well, me through some of that? There are all kinds of challenges. Um, right. And, you know, it, um, and the, they're really there, they come from two areas in historic property. One is, um, unknown conditions in the structure itself. And you can do all the due diligence you know you want, but there are gonna be things in the existing structure that you don't, that you're not able to identify or plan for, uh, which results in costs that that perhaps weren't part of the, the bid that the contractor gave you, right? And so, you know, you address that through contingency, of course, and making sure that you have a you know, pot of funds on the side to, to handle that kind of thing. Second set of problems or challenges really relate to, um, the requirements of um, the historic preservation pro of the of the federal and state historic tax credit, and there are, you know, you're eligible for these tax credits because you're agreeing to um, to accomplish the rehabilitation of the building in a way that complies with uh, the Department of Interior standards for historic preservation. And um, you know, when you look at Northrop King right now. Um, probably the biggest challenge we're facing related to that would be windows, which is always in historic preservation projects one of the one of the issues you need to be you need to be concerned about because the kind of restoration cost of those windows and then making sure that the the windows will satisfy energy standards. I mean, those kind of things are, are challenging things to balance and and result in additional cost. And so you're always trying to um, understand the benefits associated with the proceeds from these tax credits against the, the extra costs that are associated with complying with those, those types of standards. Yeah. You know, I would say that when you, if you compare that to new construction, a new construction also has challenges. I mean, you know, particularly in urban infill sites, you know, your problems are in the dirt and, and, you know, and you do as much due diligence and maybe you can do more due diligence related to that than you can in the building with historic, with historic preservation. But, um, you know, every, every, every developer working on a new construction building breathes a sigh of relief when they get out of the ground, you know, when they've addressed their foundations and their sub and their subgrade situation. Sure. Um, getting a, a little more specific, if you're possible, or if you're able to, um, I, I imagine part of the issue with windows is uh, you have to get very specific custom kind of windows, or I, I know one of the problems with Northrop King or one of the challenges was, um, insulating the place without covering the brick, right? Um, can you talk about some of those things more specifically? Sure. Um, the, well, one, with the windows, <clears throat> the windows, you know, your first path is to try to restore rather than replace windows, right? And um, you, you, only, you only replace when, when there's absolutely no way to restore. And then you replace in a way that is compatible with, with, with the requirements of the program. And, um, it, but then from a weatherization perspective, then you, it, we're right now exploring, you know, opportunities for internal storm windows, you know, to help provide additional, addi additional um, insulating values in the windows. Um, we're not sure whether that's be possible or not, but we're, we're hoping it is. Um, the, um, the brick is, there's really, really, you, you treat the brick, the, the situation with uninsulated, thankfully very thick, masonry walls, um, you know, you have to address that just through mechanical systems, you know, and making sure that you're bringing enough, um, enough heating and air conditioning, you know, in to um, achieve a comfort level that's satisfactory. It's, sure. There's no other way to do it. Right, right. Um, and you, uh, do you typically hire a historic consultant for these kind of projects? Yeah, yes. Yeah, well, one, there's always somebody with historic expertise. You know, on, on the consulting team, some architectural firms um, have that expertise built into their staff capacity. 
-hmm. and um, it's part of the service they provide. Um, and um, in this case, um, we have a consultant that's um, that is involved kind of in the project, um, providing that specific scope of service that's that's not being provided inside the architect. Sure. Gotcha. Um, so you you guys have also done like brownfields, former industrial sites, things like that. I mean, Northrop King is yep. kind of a former industrial site, right? Um, what's uh, can you just talk to me about the the motive of taking these places that maybe aren't uh, especially aesthetically pleasing or that just aren't used? What what is the motive to uh, redevelop or preserve aspects of them rather than just demolishing and starting over? Well, I think there are probably a couple of different questions there. Um, yeah, sure. You know, one, you know, we have done both, right? And um, we do urban infill, new construction, and adaptive reuse. You know, it really depends on on one of the you know the community objectives or one of the problems you're trying to address, right? And it's, you know, we don't always pick the best piece of piece of dirt for our use or the best adaptive reuse building for our use. We're we're in the business of trying to solve community solve for community objectives, and that sometimes leads to less than optimal kind of locations. I'll also say that it you know. I can think of it in all the work that I've done, there's probably one building that, that I'm not going to name that really from, from a location perspective, you know, really it's just continued challenges in 20 years of operation. You know, it's just it was really a tough spot. Mm -hmm. The rest, you know, I think might've been perceived as, as tough spots by some people, but really, you know, weren't. I, I mean, they really were, there, there were opportunities that were waiting to happen. And, and if you, you know, if you dig a little deep, deeper into community and start talking with folks, you realize um, that that's possible. I mean, the vacant buildings of the North of King are, are, they're not much, honestly, to look at, you know, um, and, and there's a lot of it, but you know, there's a ton of opportunity there. Um, so. Sure. Um, I'm also thinking, you know, going from St. Paul to Minneapolis, it seems there's, St. Paul has a lot of pretty old buildings that have stuck around. Um, do you see efforts from Minneapolis to retain some of these historic properties? Do you see a receptiveness from the city, the neighborhoods to, <clears throat> to do kind of the work that you're talking about? You know, a, a couple of things. One is um, in the 20 some years that I've been doing this, um, it used to be that big old empty warehouses were the challenge that cities were trying to solve. Um, that's not the case anymore. I mean, you know, the market has figured out, you know, adapt. Look at the North Loop. I mean, the market has right. figured out adaptive reuse of big old warehouse buildings, right? Mm -hmm. And they've they've figured out the market opportunity there as as, as opposed to the mission based opportunity there. Um, and um, I think that's true in both St. Paul and Minneapolis. Um, it, I think. Um, you know, I, I don't know how I would compare, you know, the volume of a big old historic, big old, big old buildings in St. Paul versus the volume of those buildings in Minneapolis. Um, but, you know, our first, our first three buildings were historic preservation projects in St. Paul. You know, we did the Northern in Lower Town, um, St. Paul. We did um, 653 Lofts, which was in the Frogtown neighborhood of St. Paul. And we did the Tilsner. Which is right next door to the lower town and or to the northern and lower town and and it you know in those days and that was pre my involvement in art space in those days there wasn't a lot else happening in lower town certainly and they were really trying to find a way to redevelop lower town into what it is now um, so anyway, so so it used to be we were we were doing historic preservation work to respond to those kind of those kind of goals increasingly it really is what do you do with that. Um, underutilized urban infill site, and how do you bring, um, you know, a project of scale, you know, to that site to help um, to help make a difference, you know? And I think as, as I look at, we haven't done any of this work, but as I look at what's happening on University Avenue along the light rail line, you know, that's, you know, I think I think it's a response to the light rail as a transit, you know, as a transit opportunity, but it's also a, a response to a recognition of there was a lot of stuff there that just, you know, was sitting there, you know, waiting for the opportunity. And I think folks have been clearly, there's been a lot of activity kind of in that, on that corridor. Sure. Yeah. 
Um, and maybe you could speak to that. Uh, it would probably be a little speculative. So uh, if, if you don't want to, that's fine. Um, but the, just because you, you work for a nonprofit, but the, the market value of redeveloping these, you know, like in North Loop, where redeveloping a warehouse instead of tearing it down and building something new, I can't imagine there's cost savings that come with that. Would it, do you think it's just an aesthetic aspect or what do you what do you think that is oh i think that they're you know again i'm speculating a little bit because i'm not in that in that world but um well in the north loop there's been both new construction and and adaptive reuse i think you know the game changer um in the north loop i think maybe something maybe it wasn't a game changer but something that had a lot of impact is this is the state historic tax credit that came online and, and made I think some of those buildings maybe the market hadn't quite gotten there but but maybe but that was that final economic boost maybe that, that helped make those happen mm -hmm. um, in, in a market rate way um, but I, I think people I think people like I mean if it's done right people like you know the context of a historic structure mm -hmm. I know that if you were to if you were to pull the artists um, and we talk to folks, we do, we do this when we just begin working in a community, you know, would you prefer a new construction opportunity or would you, would you, would you prefer a, to be in a historic building? Overwhelmingly, they want to be in a historic building. And I think that that's because um, history, history provides inspiration. Inspiration is a lot of, you know, a lot of what culture is about and a lot of what art's about. And, um, and they choose that, even though that historic building may be significantly compromised as, as product compared to what we might be able to construct, you know, from, from scratch. Mm -hmm. And that when you think about, you know, comfort of heating and ventilating air conditioning, when you think about noise isolation between dwelling units, when you think about efficiencies of floor plans, I mean, I mean, you can, you can do a lot in new construction that you're challenged to do sometimes in, in historic preservation, but people like that, people like that, con, you know, that inspiration, they like that um, funkiness, I think. For sure. Um, well, great, Greg. I don't really have any other questions. Is there anything you want to add that I didn't ask about? No, it's been great. Thanks. Thanks for the good article the other day. Yeah, for sure. All right. Yeah, good. Yeah. Keep in touch and uh, have a good time. Have fun. Sounds good. Yeah, you too. Thanks a lot. Take care. See you.